I don't know about you, but <clears throat> over the course of many years, I've heard quite a few sermons on that parable that Joe just read to us. By and large, those sermons have gone something like this. God has given all of his people many gifts and talents. And these are gifts and talents that we should use in the service of the church. Because when we do that, we find that uh, God blesses that giving. But don't be like the third servant who went and buried his talent in the ground. Because if you bury your talent, then one day God will, Jesus will return and God will judge what you have done and not done. And the punishment for the third servant who buried the talent in the ground sounds pretty severe. So don't be like that servant. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm not going to preach that sermon. Okay, so you've heard that one, all right and you can put that away. When I've heard sermons which take that line, personally I've been a bit dissatisfied for a number of different reasons. One of them is that the fact that the word talent even means a natural endowment or gift or ability in the English language is down to this story. <laughs> it's not that uh, talent, talent never meant that in the first instance anyway. A talent originally was just a measure of weight. And it came to be in some parts of the Middle East a kind of coinage so that talents had a certain value that you could put on it. And the commentaries will tell you various figures because the value of money changes. So we don't really know. It is true that what this master was doing in the story was giving money to his servants. However, this story still doesn't seem to add up to me. Because in many ways, it sounds suspiciously like salvation by works. That what makes the difference between these servants is that the first two go out and work for something. They invest the money. It's, we're not told exactly what they do, but they end up with twice as much as they had when they started. The other one just comes back with the money that he started with. And actually, burying money in the ground wasn't that unusual in the ancient Near East. It was considered a safe form of looking after money when you didn't have a safe. But the other reason, and this is perhaps a more, a more serious objection to understanding this story in that way, is that it lifts this story completely out of its context in the Gospels and says, you know, this is all that there is, this is all that Jesus said. When, in fact, it's in a particular context in the Gospels that we need to understand. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what did Jesus' disciples and the people who heard this story when Jesus first told it, what did they understand him to mean? Did they understand him to mean that this is about devoting our gifts and talents to the service of the church? Well, probably not. Well, what did they understand by it then? Because that's quite important, and that's the starting point where we, which we need to move on from to see if we understand the significance of this story for ourselves. Matthew <coughs> um, is not the only gospel that contains a version of this story. There's one in Luke as well, which is not really the same story. I think that the truth is that Jesus told a story like this on a number of different occasions, and possibly he meant different things on different occasions by using it. It's not the only parable in which Jesus talks about a master and his servants. 
Most of the parables where Jesus talks about the master and the servants, he is talking about God and Israel. And it's very likely that that's the meaning of this parable. Because most people, I think, know that, that Matthew's gospel was written to a largely Jewish Christian audience. So, Jesus' first hearers would have understood this as being a story which involves God and Israel, not Christians with gifts. Okay, so that's probably a starting point where we have to then unpack the story. And <clears throat> so, and then we have to consider one other thing, which is that if you read this story in the whole context and sweep of Matthew's gospel, this story was told right in the middle of Holy Week. Uh, Palm Sunday has happened, the overthrowing of the tables in the temple, that's happened, all right, but the betrayal, the crucifixion, that hasn't happened yet. So this is a time when Jesus is uh, moving around in Jerusalem with a group of disciples and the temperature is rising the whole time because the Passover is approaching. So Jesus is, is trying to talk to his disciples about the, the, the significance of the events that they are living through. And <clears throat> there are some Bible commentators who uh, will tell you that actually what this is about is Jesus warning them about the significance of what's going on right at that moment in the middle of Holy Week as he is about to go to the cross and be raised from the dead. Now it is the case that the story does start rather abruptly. Jesus is telling several stories He's just told the story about the wise and foolish virgins, the ones who weren't ready for the bridegroom when the bridegroom came and got locked out. Okay, again, probably a story about Israel, who was supposed to be the ones waiting for God to come and uh, to bring in his kingdom. But when God did that in the person of Jesus, when he showed up in the flesh, most of Israel were not interested. They didn't think he was the real deal at all. Some of them did and followed him, but many didn't. And he goes straight on from that story to say in verse 14, again, it will be like, you know, it. What is it? Well, the coming of God's kingdom in power probably in the person of Jesus through his death and resurrection. So Jesus addresses in this parable a situation he's currently right in the middle of. And the, 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 the delay between you know, God going away and then coming back is the delay between uh, between God speaking through the prophets 400 years before in the Old Testament and God coming in person in Jesus Christ. I think we can't get away from that interpretation of it. There must have been something of that in what Jesus was saying. Now in that context, there are servants who are getting on with what the master expects them to do. And there is also a servant who is going to totally ignore all of that. Could this possibly be a picture of those who respond to Jesus when he comes and who get on with what he commands them to do? And those who should have been ready for that but who completely ignored what he had to say, and if you like, buried it in the ground. The scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the ones who said, no, you're not, you know, you haven't, you're nothing to do with God, really. 
That's not what God's telling us. And <clears throat> so, the coming of this kingdom, which the Israelites thought would be a wonderful event for all of them, for everyone who was descended from Abraham, turns out, in fact, to be a point where God comes in and judges. And Jesus says, well, the moment's coming when God is going to make a judgment like that. And if you are not doing the Father's work in that time, you are going to find yourself on the wrong side of it. And it's no good coming up to God after that has happened and saying, well, I'm descended from Abraham, and uh, to which God is going to reply, no, it's not that way. It doesn't work that way. You know, it's not Abraham's blood that matters. It's Abraham's faith that matters. And it's only faith that is going to get you into the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> that means that, that here we don't have um, <coughs> a, a, a parable which is about salvation by works. But it is a parable about um, <clears throat> what is our response to God when we encounter him. Is it to respond to what he says, to gladly go away and get involved with that, even though it's not straightforward and involves a work of love? Or are we just going to take what God offers and bury it in the ground? Now, that is an important question for us to answer. And it's not about are we one or the other, but where are we going to end up when we make that choice? Are we responding to the grace that God has offered us, or are we burying it in the ground? And the difference between that is, is obvious. And the invitation from God to those who are saying yes to him is enter into your master's happiness. And that should be uh, the experience that we have because we uh, are able to reach out to God in faith. It doesn't mean that the task before us is easy, but it means that we are saying yes to God in the first instance. And it is interesting that what Jesus then goes on to do is to tell another story, which is a story about God separating sheep from goats and asking them both uh, what they have done. And <clears throat> uh, the sheep, the ones who are on the good side of, uh, of all of this deal, um, uh, uh, you know, say, you know, what, what is it that we were doing? And Jesus says to them, well, you know, when I was naked and poor, you helped me. You know, when I was in prison, you visited me. And these sheep, because they're sort of automatically doing what God is, is asking them to do, somehow don't know their own righteousness. They're those who have received a righteousness that comes from God alone. And then, you know, he turns around to the goats and they say, well, you know, when did we see you like that, Lord? <laughs> And he says, well, you know, you, you, you should have known. It was to do with whether or not you are going out every day to serve the neediest brethren and sisters around you. That's actually what makes the difference. So the third story in the chapter is also very important because it develops that, this story in the middle which is about having the correct response to God when he comes. So, <clears throat> the whole point is about serving others. This was the step change, if you like, that Jesus introduced. It wasn't that it wasn't there before, 
But the Jews had made the mistake of becoming complacent. And they felt that because they could trace back their lineage to Abraham, they were members of his family, that they were okay, that they were God's special people. And Jesus says, no, that isn't how it is. It's about faith. It's about receiving righteousness that you don't have from God. And it's about behaving in the way that God has always specified you should behave in the law. But doing that actually out of love for God and being prepared to serve those around you who God has placed there for you to minister to. So <clears throat> the times we live in uh, are, are still urgent. We live in a time when the kingdom of God is here and yet it is not here. And the needs around us are still there to be ministered to. And let's pray that we will be people who respond to God and who uh, cooperate with the work that he is doing, that others around us may be ministered to whenever they're in need.